Brett. Such an honor to have you here. Thank you. We, um, we've got a lot to cover, and obviously what you're most known for is your storied NFL career, but can you take us back to your uh, just uh, earlier years? Uh, you were overlooked uh, almost by uh, you know, colleges. You were, when you did get into the, uh, the school that you got into, you were the seventh string quarterback. Uh, and uh, even in, as a high school uh, player, uh, because your father was the coach and he ran the wishbone, no one really got to see your arm power, but take us through uh, just the years before you walked into the NFL. Yeah, so uh, you touched on it. I uh, had one scholarship offer, and that was from the University of Southern Mississippi, which came the day before the actual signing day. So throughout the recruiting process, um, to say I didn't get many looks or offers uh, is an understatement. I, I, I got none. Um, and so... Uh, and we, we all can relate to this, even though I, mine is football, it can be life in general. Um, I felt like no one wanted me, that I wasn't good enough. Um, and I felt as though I could play at the next level, um, but yet no one would offer me. The day before the, the actual signing day, I was offered by Southern Miss, I was overjoyed. Went to Southern Miss, was last on the totem pole, I um, actually didn't know if I was going to play defense or offense. I went as a defensive back, believe it or not, and a quarterback. And um, a couple of guys got hurt. Um, a couple of guys came in and didn't play it very well. And there I was. And they were like, you're going in. Are you ready? And I went, yeah. <laughs> Um, I'll learn the plays later, uh, and the rest is history. So even at Southern Miss, when you do finally work your way through the gauntlet and become the starting quarterback, the second game in the season, they're playing uh, Alabama, and uh, you upset Alabama, right? Tell us about that season. I didn't think it was an upset, actually. I, Trust I me, know David is a big Crimson Tide fan here, and I hate to burst his bubble. But we beat you guys. But we actually, Alabama played Southern Miss last Saturday. And yeah, I, and it was a little different. I did, yeah, I'd rather not talk the about that. Yeah, and then some. But tell us about tell us about that year. You not only beat Alabama, but as a starting quarterback, you almost beat Georgia, and then went on to. Yeah, so I started my true freshman year. I was 17 years old when I got my first start, um, and so I, in other words, I, I never redshirted. So I my freshman year. Sophomore year was a little better. Junior year was a little better. And so a, a lot of positive things going into my senior year. Um, believe it or not, I was up for the Heisman, which I, I, uh, didn't, at least I was up for it. That's, that's the best I can, I can say. But two weeks before the start of training camp, I was in a pretty severe car wreck. I had 36 in inches of my intestines removed. I had a fractured vertebrae in my back. I lost 36 pounds. Um, had, had surgery August 8th to remove the, the uh, basically the, the part of my intestines that had died. And so uh, I walk out of the hospital like August 14th and was told that I would probably have to redshirt and come back the following year, which would have been okay. But I was stubborn and a lot younger then, and I said, I'm going to come back and play. And September 8th, we played against Alabama. And I, I hate to tell you, but we beat them. Yes. Uh, but we, it, it, was, it, was a, uh, it was a great year for, for us, uh, for our team and for our university. Um, statistically speaking, it wasn't a great year, but um, that's okay. Um, I had a lot of fun. We beat Alabama, we beat Auburn, um, almost beat Georgia. Um, and there's not too many teams can say that. So it, it, was a, it was a fun and magical year for us. Well, our football team, our football coach beat Alabama twice, two years in, in a row. row. That's right. And that's because you, you have a great coach in Hugh Freeze. Yeah, we do. I, we I do. love that guy. Yeah. But I was born in 19, this is an exciting day for me because I was born in 1962, right after the Green Bay Packers had had one of the longest streaks of they won more Super Bowls before it was even named the Super Bowl. You're right. Than, than anybody's right. ever ever won since. 
And so the whole time I was growing up, I had Green Bay at Packers all over my walls, all, everything. And Liberty's first football team started in 1973. And I think we have a picture of the, what the uh, colors were. If, well, David said we did anyway. There it is. Gold and green for the first three years, but we were named Lynchburg Baptist College, so we had to, there was another Lynchburg College in town, and they were getting big gifts that were intended for us, and so, so we, uh, by mistake, and so we changed it during the nation's bicentennial to Liberty University, and we changed the colors to red, white, and blue, but we started with that one because my father was a huge fan of Vince Lombardi, and um, I've still got a speech of Vince Lombardi on, on my wall in the football suite that my father had on his office wall his whole life. But you and I were talking before about what a great coach he was. And um, I just remember going to, to Green Bay when I was a kid, teenager, when Bart Starr was the coach. And we, dad and I walked out on the field, we weren't supposed to be out there, but he still took a picture with us anyway. And he said, now, now get out of here, I'm doing practice. But uh, tell us what, what you've heard about Vince Lombardi and about your coach too. Well, first of all, um, you mentioned Bart Starr, and who just recently passed away, but lived a, um, a wonderful life. His wife, Cherry, is still living. Uh, I think Cherry's probably 85, and I was honored to be asked two weeks ago to escort her out of the tunnel at Lambeau Field, um, where she was to receive a helmet, really, for the Starr family. Uh, so I was a part of the ceremony in which Bart was honored. and. You know, to me, I consider myself, uh, I, I don't think historian really is a, the right word, but a, uh, a person who truly respects the guys in, in the, just the whole NFL process. Um, I can name players off of every team. Um, and, and, and so I say that because when I was traded in 1992 from Atlanta to Green Bay, um, you know, family, friends were like, man, are you ready for that cold? And I, I was so ready leaving South Mississippi. Um, they said, do you even know where Green Bay is? I said, I have no clue, but I know it's up north somewhere. Um, but I knew who Bart Starr was. I knew who Vince Lombardi is. And I, a lot of the people here are younger generation. And you may even look over and go, who, who is he talking about? And you may actually say, who am I? Um, and that's okay. That's okay. Um, but G Green Bay was a, a wonderful place for me and my family. It was, there was so much tradition in history, um, even before Lombardi with Curly Lambeau. Um, and the, uh, the Packers were, were sold for $100, like in the 20s or the teens or something. And you know, you couldn't put a price on what they're worth today and, and what they mean to so many people. So uh, Lombardi, man, that guy's got tremendous quotes. And the guys that played for him that I have become friends with, some have passed away, speak so highly of him and his leadership. Not so much his coaching, but what type of guy and more a mentor. And, and it's not so much about the X's and O's. It's about communicating with these young men and being tough, but also being fair and, and putting your arm around them. So he was all that and then some. That speech in my wall, he says, it's an American zeal to be number one in everything. And he ended that speech by saying, um, I believe in God and I believe in human decency, but I believe any man's finest hour is when he finds himself lying on the field of battle exhausted, victorious. And so it's touching, I think. Amen to that. You played 16 years with the Packers. You played on multiple teams, but obviously that's who you're more uh, known for than anyone else. Talk to us about uh, the greatest moment. We, I know that you won the Super Bowl, but mm -hmm. ironically, that's not what you consider your greatest moment. Your greatest moment was really in a, in a moment when you were mourning the loss yeah. uh, of your dad. Yeah, so uh, 16 years in Green Bay, 20 years in the NFL, uh, extremely thankful and blessed to have, have played that long um, and to play at the level I had played at. I think from a team uh, standpoint, well, I know the, the, the greatest moment would be winning the Super Bowl in, 
1996 and 97 season. Um, because as a the, the ultimate team sport, in my opinion, is football. You have to rely on each other so much. Um, if you think about it, receivers can be wide open all day long, but if the line doesn't block, the quarterback doesn't have time to get it to. And if the line blocks and the quarterback can't make the right decision, so there, there's so many factors that go into success uh, in football. And so the ultimate goal in, in, in the National Football League is to win the Super Bowls. And we did that, and that was a great, great honor and a great year. But I think my, um, the, the one moment that in my 20 years that I think about that, that is really kind of in a class by itself is one that I wish didn't happen. And it was when my father passed away, um, and we had to play Oakland um, on a Monday night a day, day and a half after my father passed away. And, and not only play, but we, it was important that we, we had to win the game in order to continue our playoff hopes. Uh, it was two days before Christmas, and uh, you'd have to know my, my father. He, he was tough, and, and Jerry and I talked about this a little bit before, and David, we talked about this on the, on the plane. Um, never once did my dad tell me he loved me. Now, do I know he loved me? Yes. Um, it was, I'm, I'm not making excuses. It was a different generation. It was tough love. He was my coach. He never wanted to show any signs of weakness. Um, and I'm, this is more of an assumption. Um, I, I, as I look back, I think he believed that had he told me great job or I love you or anything positive that it would inflate my ego or make me feel that, uh, you know, I was better than someone else and, uh, and didn't, wouldn't put in the time, the effort, and the work ethic that I had shown up to that point. Um, my dad was a, was a great father who, who was flawed like all of us. And, you know, he's got three sons and a daughter. I'm the second oldest and we're all flawed. But, you know, I, I've learned from my dad and tell my kids and grandkids that I love them. I tell them over and over again till they say, we know, we know. Um, so all that being said, my father passes away. Um, he was my mentor. He was my coach. He was all those things. And it wasn't a question, even though the media made it out to be a question of whether or not I would play. Um, the question was not would I play. The question was could I play in a, in a way in which I honored my father that no one could understand. Um, I didn't want to play, win or lose, media afterwards, fans, just people in general said, well, what do you expect? He played with his father, had just passed away. You know, how could he play at a high level? And, and of course, I prayed so, so much leading up to that game, and my good friend Doug Peterson, who was right by my side, who is now the, the head coach at the Philadelphia Eagles, is also a friend of J.D., and, 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 and J.D. knows Doug very well, but we prayed so much right up until we went out for pregame. Um, we had a prayer right, right in uh, my locker, and I just wanted to honor my – I wanted to win the football game. I didn't care about being the greatest player that night. I, 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 wa I wanted to honor my father in a way that, that he would be proud. And, you know, we, we talked about this on the plane – it was, it was that times a thousand. You know, the, I had a first half that I never, in 20 years, just to give you an idea, um, I threw for a lot of yards, and at one time I had every passing record in the NFL. Um, with, with so many yards, I only threw for 400 yards twice in my career. Guys do it all the time. In a whole game. In a whole game. In 20 years. And had all the records. So you think I would have to throw for a 600-yard game or 500-yard game. No, I, the most I ever had was two 400-yard games. That game, I had 399 at halftime. So um, I had a half of football that was, was better than any full game that I had had in my, in my whole career. Um, and what I realized later after I retired as I think about that game is that I, and maybe you as well, have oftentimes said, you know, God, I, 
show me you're real. Just, you know, show yourself just for me, just for a second. However, uh, come out of the clouds, cross the road, whatever. And you look for these signs and you, and you never see them when they're right there in front of you. And for me, the sign was how I played in that game. And, you know, I'm looking for some, you know, some figure to come out of the clouds or out of the sky when the signs were right there in front of me. And that's the one thing that, um, you know, I wonder if my, if my father uh, w was saved. I mean, he was 56 when he passed away. I'll be 50 in two weeks, so I'm getting close to that age. I know my dad, we went to church uh, all the time. Um, but what was in his heart? I, I wonder that. And I, I believe that I've, I've gotten those answers. And, um, you know, I think back with mixed emotions about that game. It was such a difficult uh, time and, and game in which to play in. But I'm also very thankful that I played and honored him the way I, I did. Well, I found out this morning that I hold one record that Brett Favre doesn't hold. The most number of cheerleaders on my show. I saw the picture. <laughs> they got it, I think. But anyway, he said, oh, all right, never, that's <laughs> 450 pounds, 450 pounds for 30 seconds. So, wow. um, wow. I, I couldn't do it. <laughs> it's a good thing you guys had your eyes closed while the David was praying, because when I saw how he was dressed casually, I took off my blazer and my shirt and put this on on stage. So <laughs> thank God you had your eyes closed. But <laughs> anyhow, tell us about first priority. That's a, that's a great question. I've, I've been in the student ministry, uh, served the local church for 16 years, and uh, uh, God brought an opportunity for me, cross paths with David when he was selling t-shirts for Rick Stanley. Y'all don't know who that guy is, but he Elvis was a uh, yes, right. Elvis and, uh, Presley's he son. said, "Do you mind if I let this guy share his testimony at a youth camp?" And I go, "Sure." He drives up in his big white jacked-up jeep, and he's got all these shirt T-shirts. And it was David Nasser telling my youth group his his how he came to Christ. That's how far back I know that guy. Mm -hmm. And in the ministry that I've done in a local church, I've always if we only gather together as the body when we come together for big events, Disciple Now or a big See at the Pole rally. And this guy named Benny Prophet said, what if we came together every week and went on a nine-month mission trip? What if we got the body of Christ and armed them on the campus with a, a strategy to influence their fear, peers for Christ? So every four weeks on a local high school campus all across America, mm -hmm. students are sharing their faith and, and inviting their friend to come to Christ. It's student-led, it's student-initiated, and uh, we would not be where we are if it wouldn't be for Brett and Deanna. You know, I, I came, stepped out of faith. We're, we're a nonprofit. I don't raise near the amount of money that you have to raise here. But God's blessed us. We're in our 21st year of doing this ministry. And Deanna came to us and said, well, you're doing this all wrong. And I said, yes, ma'am. Just like Brett says, yes, ma'am. Taught us how to do these things. And we are where we are today because of the heart and because of the folks like uh, Brett and Deanna that care about what God's doing through a local uh, church-led ministry called First Priority. Awesome. That's awesome. My wife says I talk too much in these panels, so you go ahead, David. I, I, one of the reasons we wanted JD to be a part of this panel is because of your friendship. And I, I'd love to just ask, uh, you know, because I think sometimes God will bring a Brett Favre into the life of someone in this room. Maybe later in your life, God will give you a chance to be a good friend of a, of a, of a world-renowned uh, you know, influencer, maybe a, a professional athlete, maybe it's a, a musician, maybe it's someone who uh, is moving the needle on the economy. So what are some, what are some things, can you just talk about the dynamics of your friendship? I know you guys just, you hunt together. Yesterday you went on a 30 mile bike ride, you know, and so you guys are friends and you get along because you like each other, but as two brothers in Christ, uh, he doesn't just support you financially. How do you support him? Um, talk about the dynamic of your friendship. Here's a guy from Louisiana. That's me. Went to that Bible school in Baton Rouge called LSU. That's not a Bible school. Just seeing if you're listening. That's where God called me to ministry. That's why I say it. And uh, I, came to, I came to Hattiesburg in 1989, and there were far for Heisman's bumper stickers. Now, I came from Baton Rouge. I didn't even know they had a university in Hattiesburg called Southern Miss. And there's this, high, this Favre guy. Watched him in college, watched him as he went off. 
And uh, somehow, somewhere our paths crossed because of, of Deanna, his wife, you know, connected us on a hunting venture. And it's like two rednecks to get together. You know each other, no matter what state you're from, you know, you understand without having to say a lot. And the thing I would say to that, you know, the first time Brett and I met, he was like, he'd follow in the truck with somebody. Then he said, okay, JD's, because they're always looking, if someone's of stature is looking, why do you want to get involved in my life? You know, because they're, they're waiting for the ask. Oh, here it comes. He's going to ask. He's going to ask me to do something. And I just, you know, was drawn to who he was. The, and we had the same love for our family. We, we, we outpunted our coverage. We have godly wife. We have beautiful wives. Uh, we have children. And we just connected on that basic level of how do we, how do we raise our family? How do, you, you know, how do we go through life and ask these questions back and forth through time? It became where we are today. So it's one of those, you know, I don't have to think about it. But if you're thinking about somebody like, oh, I want to have, you said Justin Bieber was here. I don't know who that is, but he was here. Yeah, who's Justin Bieber? I don't know. No, his pastor, Carl Lenz, was here. Okay. And we, we would love to have Justin here. If you're watching, Justin, come on. But the biggest thing I do now is when he was playing, I, we text, we, you know, I can remember the night he, that he did. I was just, I was in my living room shouting when that happened. I was saying, I know this is tough. We were there at the funeral. We were there, you know, when he got done, that's the first thing I texted. I said, brother, what a God thing. And I was like, you know, he's had all these other things. Boom, I get a text within minutes because he's sitting there, you know, thank you. God, you know, what he's just heard, he shared those stories. But the biggest thing I try to tell people is, you know, you, you guard your relationship. Because you, you tell anybody you're from Hattiesburg, Mississippi, they don't care who I am. They don't care. They go, that's where Brett Favre is. And they go, do you know him? Can you, can you do this? Can you do that? So I, I filter a lot of things that way to protect them. But also, just be a servant. Love, love without, without any strings. Find opportunities to do things for these people that they just want to be normal. Brett's a normal guy. You know, uh, I wish I could get away with wearing shorts at a, at a chapel and, and uh, coming to Liberty University. But what are the odds of a guy? Yeah. He, he asked me the dress code. I told him, and it didn't matter what I would say. Anyway, he's going to do what he's going to do. I'm just surprised he's not wearing those Wrangler U-shaped jeans. What about those jeans? Oh, we go. What about those skinny jeans, Brett? <laughs> Brett was making fun of my skinny jeans uh, on the flight over here. You're supposed to be skinny when you have skinny jeans, right? That's true. That's true. Yeah, we, we go to my office and he disappears and he came out and he was literally wearing, look at these pants he was wearing. These are, he borrowed, there it is. <laughs> Speaking of Carl Lenz. And then he let me borrow his jeans. Yeah, so you wore mine. There it is. <laughs> Never again. That was the worst setup ever. So talk to us about honor and integrity. <laughs> oh, Hey, real quick, uh, one of the things that I really do admire the most about you is you really are just a, a, a friend to, to my friend, but you also seem to be very invested in your family. You know, you're always, always uh, pointing to your wife as a great example. Even when you won the Hall of Fame uh, in that induction ceremony, you honored her. I want to see this quick, you know, just clip of that and then ask you about your relationship with your wife. What have you learned from your wife, uh, just watching her battle cancer and conquer it? Um, what I've learned from her is she's a heck of a lot tougher than I am. Uh, they may call me the Iron Man or whatever, but, you know, J.D. and I were just talking that, what was that, <laughs> eight years ago maybe, seven, eight years ago? She's competing in another one this Sunday, um, an Iron Man in Augusta, Georgia. I have no idea how they do it. Um, I, I thought our little 25-mile bike ride yesterday was tough, um, which it was tougher for J.D., by the way. Yeah, but chasing little kids around is the hardest yeah, job in the yeah. world. Yeah, and then having, uh, our, we have a 30-year-old daughter who uh, graduated from Loyola in New Orleans in law school and decided now that she wants to be an English professor. I said, okay. She's got three boys, so I have three grandsons. Our youngest daughter is 20, and she's a junior at Southern Miss and plays volleyball. Um, and parenting is tough. Parenting is very tough. Um, parenting girls, and I saw Erin, Jim Kelly's, Jill, Jill and Jim's daughter, Erin. The last time I saw her, I think she was three. She was about this tall. 
And, um, uh, you know, and I, I, I bring her up because I think about my own children and how tough it is. And I couldn't, obviously couldn't do it without Deanna and vice versa. But she, uh, she's, she's seen, seen it all and, and fought it all and has managed to stay afloat and, and, and thrive. And like any good woman does. And so, uh, you know, we just tag along. Yeah, I've got a 30-year-old, 26-year-old, and I've got a daughter here at Liberty, Caroline, who's a sophomore, and she loves it. And I know what advice young men nowadays need. Get off the video games and go to college. But what do you think is the best advice to give young women in college? Well, I'll tell you what I told, and I'll start with my youngest daughter. Before she went to high school, I mean, excuse me, before she went to college, I tried to prep her for what I thought she may face. And I know times change and generations um, change. But she was 16, 17 at the time, never drank, and, and never had a date. And to this, she's 20 years old and nothing has changed. Um, I mean, she may have tried a beer. I, I'm not going to sit here and say she, she hasn't. She may have. I don't know that. but. But I say, I say this to her. I said, you know, I, I'm very proud of the, the young lady that you have become, um, not because you don't drink and, and you know, get into trouble and all those things, but, but she's a very thoughtful, loving, caring person, almost too much where things bother her and that, that she can't control. But I said, what you're going to face in college is you're going to face, whether it be teammates, if you get into a sorority or just students in general, they're going to say, come on, ride with us. We're going to go have a beer. Your mom and dad are not around. No one's going to tell them. You can have one beer or you can have one pill. I mean, smoke one joint. I mean, come on, don't be, you know, so stiff. Relax, have fun. I mean, this is, this is fun. And I said, at that point, you're going to be faced with two options. Do I stick with my faith and what I believe in and what I was taught, or do I go with the popular choice? Because I said, if you, if you say, no, I'm not, you know, you guys go ahead, um, they're going to say, well, you're no fun, and they're going to defriend you or whatever it's called. And, um, and I said, and that will probably bother you, and it will bother you either enough that you join the popular crowd. Um, or do you continue to let it bother, bother you, for, you know, throughout? And I said, at some point, you get to an age, as we all, us up here, and, I, you know, what, what age that is is different for everyone, but you get to a point where you're not swayed by outside influences and what you thought was a big deal. Oh, I got, I got zits on my face. At 40, you go, who cares? You know, and trying to tell your kids that someday you will get to that point, but to, to stand true to your faith and what you believe in and in, in the face of some of the, the tough, toughest opposition you're going to face, and that's your peers. And so, um, and, that's, and as parents, and we, we all can speak volumes on this, you hurt for your kids. I see what my parents went through. Um, and so you don't, you want to protect them, but also it's difficult because they kind of have to learn for themselves. Um, and that's painful. Um, and so, again, it's, it's tough. It's, and it's a lot tougher, I think, with, with girls. Uh, it was more complicated. A lot of things I don't understand uh, and never will. But, um, but I'm very proud of both my daughters. And, um, you know, they've turned out to be pretty doggone good. I love having daughters-in-law, but I don't know if I'll ever be able to get used to having a son-in-law, so we'll see. Anyway. <laughs> I, love, I love the one she's dating, but that's just a different dynamic altogether. Well, I have a son-in-law, and he's from Manchester, England, and he actually came up it's Manchester in the house, I guess. Um, uh, he went to the school that David went to, William Carey University in, in Hattiesburg, and played soccer. Um, 
so we go back and forth about what is really football. I say you throw it, he says you kick it. So, but he's a good, good guy. We uh, wanted to finish out our time. We've got about 10 minutes uh, to, with a fun game uh, that we we're gonna ask Becky and Mike Donahue to come out and join us in as well. Uh, but before we do that, um, this wasn't even a question on our Q&A uh, cards, but I was just so moved this morning uh, as we were just hanging and talking about life and faith, about uh, your favorite story in scripture and the way that you um, voiced it and exemplified it. It was such a gospel presentation. Uh, will you just talk a little bit about your favorite story in all of the Bible? Yeah, you know, David kind of caught me off guard on the, on the plane over and asked me that question. And although there's a lot of great stories and everyone has their own and everyone has their own uh, verse that they love, I, I, I tend to, to like uh, in Luke where Jesus is being crucified and there's two criminals, hardcore criminals right beside him, which obviously Jesus was not a criminal. Um, one chose to, to ask for forgiveness, and the other was steadfast in being a criminal. And one was forgiven in spite of all the things that he had done. At that weak moment, he decided to, to ask for forgiveness, and he was forgiven. And he entered the, the kingdom of God. And if he can do it, we all can do it. We all need it. You were talking about how you resonate with that thief on the cross in your own life, and you're never going to be perfect, but you're just, you're forgiven. I tell my daughter, uh, the, the youngest, because she's at that phase right now where everything matters, what people think, what people say, everything, how you look. And I said, you're absolutely beautiful. Um, you know, I, I look at you and I see perfect. And she said, yeah, but you're my dad. And I said, yes, I am your dad. And I said, and I'll tell you this, you're not, you're not perfect. Neither am I, neither is anyone else in this room. None of us are perfect. The pretty one wants to be smarter. The smarter, get, smarter one wants to be prettier. The guy who can run fast wishes he can make the grades. And so on and so forth. Everybody wishes they had something that the other has and vice versa. And some get more trouble than others. And it, I mean, it, we all have flaws. And so do not try to be perfect because it's impossible. Be who you are yep. and, um, and trust that God has you back. And, and, and that's what Christianity is all about. That's what a lot of religious people who don't understand that, who think that their, their sin's not as bad as somebody else's, turn more people away from Christianity than anything else in the world, I believe. So I couldn't agree with you more. 100%. So honestly, if you're visiting with us um, and, and you're here and you're thinking about college, maybe God had predestined this as a bigger moment, and maybe you just needed to hear that one truth. Uh, whether you love football or not, whether you love you know, uh, 10th Avenue North or not, maybe the biggest thing you're gonna walk away from um, this weekend learning is this reality that all have sinned and fallen short to the glory of God. Brett Favre needs Jesus just as much as Jerry Falwell, Absolutely. as David Nasser, as anyone else. And so Billy Graham, all the way to Hitler, all have sinned and fallen short to the glory of God. And we're all the thieves on the cross. And so we go to Jesus and Jesus says, you're 100% guilty, but I die on the cross for you. And if you receive me, you're 100% forgiven. And that's really what makes us all on even footing at the foot of the cross, amen? Amen. We wanna play this game uh, to set up the game. Since uh, Brett and JD, you're both big duck hunters and big, you know, just, just second amendment guys, all right? We got this game for you. Let's watch this video and we'll play this game before we leave. Adio there, Liberty and Seafall students. Buckle up your bootstraps for Liberty University Duck Hunt. Today's team of hunters will be led by NFL legend and Super Bowl champion, Brett Favre, as they fire a barrage of footballs across the Liberty University Vine Center at a flock of ducks for the classic video game, Duck Hunt. Each of these ducks will be carried by RAs and RSs who will work as teams of eight to represent Dorn Trump, the quads, and the circle. Each team will need to dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge their way across the gym floor five times without having their duck 
Pipe plugged from the sky by our pig skin tossing team of sharpshooters. Any RAs, RS, and goose gets cooked will be eliminated from the game, and the team with the most ducks still quacking after five rounds will be our winner. Now, since President of All Well and Brett Favre are both modified, country fine, certified Green Bay cheese heads, today's winning dorm will win a day's supply of cheeses. So hold on tight to your Second Amendment rights as we find out whether the quads or the circle has the dodgiest ducks of the pond as we play Liberty University Duck Hunt. Round one is about to start. Hunters, take your mark. Ducks, get ready. On your mark, get set, go. Round two is about to start. Hunters, take your mark. Ducks, get ready. On your mark, get set, go. <laughs> Round three is about to start. Hunters, take your mark. Ducks, get ready. On your mark, get set, go. Ready? Round four is about to start. Hunters, take your mark. Ducks, get ready. On your mark, get set, go. Well, folks, that's it. Looks like the circle is the big winner today. Congrats! The circle and the quad. All of you get cheese heads, okay? All of you get them. Hey, before we get out of here, real, real quick, real, real quick. Since today we played Duck Hunt, the folks at Sodexo want you to know that today at the Sodexo, the all the at the Rot, we're serving duck for everybody for lunch today. All right, so it'll be on the international thing. Hey, God bless you guys. You're dismissed. Get out of here. Have a great weekend.